Howdy. This video is on intermolecular forces, specifically London dispersion, dipole induced dipole, and dipole dipole. London dispersion is also referred to as induced dipole, induced dipole. Now, everything has London dispersion forces, and so London dispersion is one of the most important intermolecular forces. Everything can be polarized and have a partial, a temporary dipole moment. Dipole induced dipole interaction is why gases dissolve in water, and so it's important. Dipole dipole interaction is actually the interaction between two polar molecules, and often they can dominate intermolecular forces. And so hydrogen bonding is a form of dipole dipole interaction. After watching this video, you should be able to describe what London dispersion is, identify when it occurs, and describe examples of it and explain why the examples are important. You should also be able to do the same thing for dipole induced dipole and for the dipole dipole interaction. And so intramolecular forces are the forces that hold atoms together to form molecules, so that's covalent bonds. Intermolecular forces are the forces between molecules, between molecules and ions, or between ions. Now often intermolecular forces are much weaker than intramolecular forces. The exceptions would be the ion-ion interaction and the ion-dipole interaction. And so it's a little bit of a misnomer. We say intermolecular forces, but we include the ion-ion interaction and the ion-dipole interaction. Now these intermolecular forces determine boiling points, melting points, vapor pressure, solubility, viscosity, surface tension, capillary reaction, etc. And so a lot of physical properties are a result of intermolecular forces. And so in general, the stronger the intermolecular forces, the more kinetic energy is needed to overcome the intermolecular attraction, the higher the melting point, the higher the boiling point, and the lower the vapor pressure. And so all intermolecular forces are electrostatic in origin, and so that means they follow Coulomb's law. And so Coulomb's law says the force of the attraction is equal to K, a constant we don't really care about, times charge on particle one, char times charge on particle two, divided by the distance um, between the particles squared. And so the stronger the attraction, the more stable the configuration, the stronger the repulsion, the less stable. According to Coulomb's law, the bigger the charges, um, the stronger the interaction. And when I say bigger charges, typically we mean absolute value. And so we treat a plus two and a minus two the same way. The shorter the distance, the stronger the, the interaction. And so electrostatic interaction um, determines energy of atomic orbitals, bonding electrons, lattice set energy. Also, you know, molecules take the shape to try to minimize the repulsion between regions of electron density. And so we see here intermolecular forces is, is another example where the electrostatic interaction is actually pretty important. And so we can actually break down the different intermolecular forces into ion ion, ion dipole, dipole dipole, dipole induced dipole, and induced dipole induced dipole. And so polar molecules have dipole moments. And so when you see dipole-dipole, that means interaction between two polar molecules. A nonpolar molecule can be induced to have a temporary dipole moment. And so when you see induced dipole moment, think about a nonpolar molecule, but also again, everything can be induced to have a dipole moment. So even polar molecules experience induced dipole, induced dipole. And so ion-ion is just the interaction between two ions. Ion um, dipole is the interaction between an ion and a polar molecule. Uh, Dipole-dipole is the interaction between two polar molecules. Dipole-induced dipole, interaction between a polar molecule and a nonpolar molecule. And induced dipole, induced dipole, nonpolar molecule, nonpolar molecule. But again, it could also be polar molecule, polar molecule, because everything has induced dipole, induced dipole. And I'll refer to induced dipole also induced dipole induced dipole also as lend dispersion i'll use those two terms interchangeably and so to know that you we have to know what interaction is present um, to understand the strength of intermolecular forces and so we have to be able to recognize are we talking about an ionic compound or molecular compound and if it's a molecule we have to recognize is it polar or is it nonpolar now we can actually give typical energies for these different interactions. And so ion ion is about 250 kilojoules per mole. And so that's the interaction between two ions. Ion dipole about 150. And again, these are just really rough estimates. Um, hydrogen bonding about 20 kilojoules per mole. Dipole dipole, in, dipole induced dipole, and then dispersion all about two. And so for the molecules, things without a charge, you know, these bottom four are all that's possible. 
And so notice that hydrogen bonding is by far the strongest. And so if you have a group of molecules and one has hydrogen bonding and the others do not, that's the one that's going to have the hydrogen bonding, it's going to have the strongest interaction and the highest melting point, highest boiling point. Now, if you're looking at a molecule versus ionic compound, you notice the ionic compound is going to have a much higher melting point than the molecule because of intermolecular forces present. And so while hydrogen bonding is a form of dipole-dipole interaction, it's an especially strong form of dipole-dipole interaction. Again, it's the strongest intermolecular forces between two molecules, between two non-charged species. Um, dipole-dipole, regular dipole-dipole, dipole induced dipole and on dispersion all have about the same and so if you have molecules at these bottom three it can be a little tricky to figure out which is going to be the strongest interaction uh, what we'll see is lens dispersion actually depends on mass the more massive the easier is the polarized the stronger lens dispersion and so if you have a series of molecules which one is much more massive than the other um, the more massive one could have the strongest interaction if you have a series of molecules about the same molecular weight, and so their London dispersion would be about the same, and one was polar, then that one's going to have the stronger interaction. If you have a series of molecules, one has hydrogen bonding, then that is always going to be the strongest interaction for molecules. And so when you're asked about boiling point, melting point, vapor pressure, or strongest intermolecular forces, you know, first you have to figure out is it an ionic compound or is it a molecular species? And if it's a molecular species, you have to figure out is it polar or nonpolar, and so you have to be able to draw the Lewis electron dot structure, Lewis electron dot diagram, sorry. And so you need to know the relative strengths of the intermolecular forces. And again, all intermolecular forces are based on the electrostatic attraction. And so induced dipole, induced dipole, or lens dispersion um, is when things get polarized temporarily. And so the more massive, the easier it is to polarize. And so typically, the more massive, the stronger the lens dispersion interaction. Everything has lens dispersion. And so iodine molecules are nonpolar, but when they get next to each other, they can induce a dipole moment into each, each other. An iodine molecule has, on average, an electron cloud that is symmetrically spread over each iodine atom. I2 is not polar. The attractions or repulsions between the atoms of I2 molecules can distort their electron clouds. Dipoles can thereby be induced momentarily in neighboring molecules. And so lens dispersion, again, dipole moments get induced. They're temporary and they're typically weak. And again, the more massive, typically easier it is to induce a dipole moment. And so uh, here's a series of alkanes. And it's kind of interesting, if you look at it, the boiling point increases as you increase the molar mass. Now you should remember that the difference in electronegativity between carbon and hydrogen is less than 0.5. And so we typically, we characterize the carbon-hydrogen bonds as nonpolar. Carbon typically does not have a lone pair. And so all alkanes are nonpolar. And so the only interaction here is going to be lens dispersion. And again, the more massive, the stronger the interaction, the higher the boiling point. And so we can actually put on the graph, graph and it just happens that it's a linear. And so again, the more massive, the stronger the dispersion interaction, um, the higher the boiling point. If we look at a wider range of the compounds, you know, the top four here are gases at room temperature. The bottom ones are liquids at room temperature. And you notice that as you increase the molar mass, um, the boiling point increases dramatically. And so when looking at molecules that are nonpolar, um, the first consideration is going to be molar mass. The higher the molar mass, easier it is to polarize, the larger the London dispersion. And you got to remember molar mass is related to the strength of the London dispersion interaction. Now a secondary consideration is actually the shape of the molecule. And so if you have molecules that are elongated, there's more surface area that they can actually interact, and so that will give you a stronger lens dispersion. If you have molecules that look like spheres, there's less surface area for them to interact, and so that will give you a weaker lens dispersion. And so you can imagine long chain alkanes versus branched alkanes. And so you only actually look at surface area of the molecules if they all have about the same molar mass. 
And so we can look at some structural isomers of C6H14. And so here we have five. They're all composed of the same exact set of atoms, just different arrangements. And so for hexane, it's a long chain alkane. And so it's gonna have a longer surface area than say for the 2,2-dimethylbutane or 2,3-dimethylbutane, which is you know, not, not spherical, but more spherical shape. And so notice that the hexane by far has the highest boiling point and the highest melting point of all these compounds. Um, boiling point is actually most correlated with intermolecular forces, strength of the intermolecular forces. A melting point is not so much because you also have to consider the stability of the liquid. And so when you're looking at intermolecular forces, the first thing you look at is molecular weight. The higher the molecular weight, the stronger the linen dispersion. If they have the same molecular weight, then you look at surface area. Now, dipole-induced dipole is an interaction basically between a polar molecule and a non-polar mo molecule. Remember, polar molecules have dipole moments. And so when you see dipole-induced dipole, think about uh, polar molecule, non-polar molecule. And so a polar molecule can induce a dipole moment into a non-polar molecule. And so on the right, we have water, which is very polar. On the left, we have um, oxygen molecule, which is very nonpolar. On average, the electron cloud of an O2 molecule is distributed symmetrically across the molecule. The molecule is not polar. A water molecule, which is polar, repels the electron cloud, causing it to be asymmetrically distributed and thereby induces a dipole in the O2. This shift allows O2 to be weakly attracted to the water molecule. And so by inducing a dipole moment into the oxygen molecule, now oxygen has a partial positive charge, partial negative charge, it has a temporary dipole moment. And so then you have electrostatic attraction between the water molecule and the oxygen molecule. And so this is actually why gases dissolve in liquids, um, because you have to you know, have an interaction between the gas molecule and the water molecule. And the stronger the ion dipole, sorry, the stronger the dipole induced dipole interaction, the more soluble. And so if you look at the O2, N2, and the helium, you see the O2 is going to have the stronger um, dipole induced dipole interaction than N2 and then helium. And so if your polar molecule is the same, and then the induced dipole, you know, again, the more massive, the easier it is to polarize. And so if we look at these gases, Kf is the Henry's law constant. And so on this slide, we see that the solubility of the gas is equal to the constant times the partial pressure of the gas. As you increase the pressure of the gas, you increase the solubility. And so you can imagine that um, this, the slope of this line is basically the Henry's law constant. And so the bigger the Henry's law constant, the stronger the dipole-induced dipole interaction, which means the easier it is to polarize. And so you'd expect that the bigger the molecule, the easier it is to polarize, the stronger the dipole-induced dipole interaction, and hence the larger the Henry's law constant. And so CO2 has a Henry's law constant of 2.3 times 10 minus 2. You notice that helium is very small at 3.7 times 10 minus 4. Four. And so helium is not very soluble in water because it has a weak interaction with the water molecules. And CO2 is much more soluble in water because it has much stronger interaction with the water molecules. And so for both um, lend dispersion and dipole induced dipole, the more massive, the stronger the interaction. And then if we look at dipole-dipole interaction, again, a polar molecule is a dipole moment. And so dipole-dipole is an interaction between two polar molecules. And so HCl is a polar molecule. The difference electronegativity of that bond is pretty big. Uh, electronegativity of hydrogen is 2.2. For chlorine, it's 3. And so that gives us a difference of 0.8. And remember, if the difference electronegativity is greater than 0.5, we consider the bond polar covalent. And that if you have a diatomic molecule, meaning just a molecule composed of two atoms, if the bond is polar, then the molecule is polar. And so for HCl, it is polar. And again, one of the reasons that whether or not a molecule is polar or nonpolar is important because that affects the interaction between the molecules. And so the chlorine is more electronegative and so has a partial negative charge. The hydrogen's less electronegative as a partial positive charge. And so there's gonna be electrostatic attraction between these two molecules.
Hydrogen chloride molecules are polar. When HCl molecules in the gas phase are cooled, the kinetic energy of the molecules can no longer overcome the dipole-dipole forces between them. The opposite ends of the molecules attract each other and coalesce to form a liquid. And so often what, we'll th what you should think about a phase transition as a competition between kinetic energy and intermolecular forces. And so as you reduce the temperature, you're, you're reducing kinetic energy and intermolecular forces are becoming more important. If you raise the temperature, you're increasing the kinetic energy at the atomic level and then they can overcome the intermolecular forces. Now if you notice here, the hydrogen is attracted to the chlorine of the different molecule because again the hydrogen has a partial positive, chlorine partial negative. Um, hydrogen attracted partial negative, again here and here. And so dipole-dipole interaction, one of the molecules is partial positive, the other end is partial negative. And so the partial positive end of one molecule is going to be attracted to the partial negative end of the other molecule. And again, for London dispersion, it's about molecular weight. And so often when you're looking at effective dipole-dipole, you want to look at when the molecular weight is about the same and so if we look at N2 and HF, they have about the same molecular weight, 28 and 20. Now N2 is nonpolar, HF is polar, and so you notice that the boiling point is much higher for the HF. The stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the boiling point, the higher the melting point, and the lower the vapor pressure. If we look at um, Br2 and ICL, they have about the same molecular weight. Bromine is going to be nonpolar, ICL is going to be a little polar, and so polar gives a stronger intermolecular force and a higher boiling point. And so for polar molecules, um, the more polar molecule, the stronger electrolytic attraction, the higher the melting point, higher the boiling point, lower the vapor pressure. For nonpolar molecules, they only have London dispersion, and for London dispersion, the larger, the more mass of the molecule, easier to polarize, the stronger electrolytic attraction, higher melting point, higher boiling point, and the lower vapor pressure. And so a question you could face in the future would be, put the following in order of increasing melting point. And so we should recognize, first we have to determine intermolecular forces. And so we should recognize that in each, in each of these we have um, two nonmetals. And so these are going to just be molecular species. And then we have to figure out, is it, are they polar or nonpolar? And we can draw those diagrams, we'd find that they're all nonpolar. When you have a center atom surrounded by the same type of outer atoms and no lone pair on the center, it has to be nonpolar. And so all three of these are nonpolar. And so the only intermolecular force is going to be London dispersion. And for London dispersion, the larger the molecular weight, the more polarizable, the stronger the London dispersion forces. And the higher melting point, higher boiling point, lower the vapor pressure. And so um, methane has the lowest, the weakest intermolecular forces because it has the lowest mass, carbon tetrachloride, the largest London dispersion forces, and so it has the highest boiling point, highest melting point, which has a higher vapor pressure, boron trichloride or boron trifluoride. And again, we recognize that we have a metal and a nonmetal. Sorry, we have two nonmetals, and so it's a molecular species. We can draw Lewis diagrams, we'd find that they're both. Um, nonpolar. They're both trigonal, trigonal planar electron geometries, and so they're both nonpolar. Now, so the only interaction they're going to have is lend dispersion, and so the more massive, the easier it is to polarize, the stronger the interaction, the higher the boiling point, higher the melting point, and the lower the vapor pressure. And so, um, boron trichloride has a boiling point of 12.5. Um, boron trifluoride minus 100 and so the um, boron trifluoride has the higher vapor pressure at the same temperature of the boron trichloride and so the stronger interaction the lower the vapor pressure and so boron trichloride would have, have the lower vapor pressure the weaker the interaction the lower the boiling point lower the melting point higher the vapor pressure And so physical, um, intermolecular force is very important for physical properties. And again, in general, the stronger intermolecular force, the more kinetic energy is needed to overcome the intermolecular force, the higher the melting point, higher the boiling point, and the lower the vapor pressure at any given temperature. I hope that was helpful.